Thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is Mike. I'm a program director. I'm a hiring director. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about my background. Uh, for those of you that are here joining us and take the time out of your day, we appreciate it. We're going to go in depth into a couple of our programs today. We can do a broader overview as well. We are recording this webinar and it'll be up on our website uh, in the next day or two once it's over. And even uh, if you aren't here today, we will be sending the recording out to everybody that RSVP'd. Excuse me, and you're welcome to share that with your friends and family and, and everything as well. So you all will be receiving this recording. So if you can't stay the whole time or whatever, you'll get full recording uh, in the next couple of days as well. Um, there is at the bottom of your screen, there should be a Q&A, a question and answer box. If you do have questions throughout the course of the presentation today, you're welcome to pop them into that chat. My colleagues, Andrew and John and Rebecca are available behind the scenes helping with the tech today, and they'll be available to answer questions uh, as, as they arise. I'm sure I'll answer a lot uh, during the next half hour or so that we spend together, uh, but at any point, pop them in that Q&A. They can answer them live uh, in the chat, or at the very end, we'll have time for some Q&A as well. So please use that box. We love questions. Um, happy to answer anything for you that we can. So the plan over the next, as I said, 30, 35 minutes is to talk a little bit in depth about two of our programs uh, for this summer, our DC and Houston aerospace and the race to Mars trip, as well as our Greece and Italy uh, ancient civilization history and myth program. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what sets Smithsonian apart. We'll meet some of our leaders and experts um, and again, answer any questions uh, that arise. So the Smithsonian Institution uh, is celebrating 175 years of existence. Their main goal is to increase and diffuse knowledge worldwide. You may know them mostly from their museums uh, on the National Mall in Washington, DC, but they also have the Cooper Hewitt Museum in New York and many other affiliates around the world. Uh, seen here is what's known as the Smithsonian Castle. It's located right on the National Mall in Washington, DC. Um, and it's actually starting to go under a pretty big renovation as well, which is very exciting. But for students that are on the DC and Houston program this morning, they'll be able to at least um, take some photos and visit the outside and, and maybe get access inside. It depends on when the renovations are starting. Um, but uh, it's the Smithsonian's 175 years of kind of increasing and diffusing knowledge uh, that are at the heart of all of the programs that we offer, whether it's DC and Houston or Greece and Italy or Belize, Costa Rica, anything that we, uh, any programs that we run uh, in the summer come with that kind of uh, at, the, at the heart of the trip. In collaboration with the Smithsonian uh, is Putney Student Travel. And this is on the website. It's a true collaboration between Putney Student Travel and our colleagues in Washington, DC at the Smithsonian. So Putney Student Travel has been running student programs for middle and high school students um, since 1951. So this is our 72nd year. So Putney's history, knowledge, know-how of operating summer programs for that age group combined with the resources of the, muse of the Smithsonian Museums, research complexes, uh, the National Zoo and everything else uh, come together to form this collaboration uh, I, I'm here right now in this office. This is the Putney Student Travel Office. We're located in Southern Vermont. Um, my window's right there in the upper left-hand corner. Um, and I, I work with our colleagues in DC very closely to manage and uh, to run these programs of Smithsonian Student Travel. Uh, Putney was started uh, again in 1951 by a husband and wife team uh, in the aftermath of World War II, getting students out of their comfort zones, out into the world to become better global citizens. Uh, their two sons, Pete and Jeff, took over operations in the 80s, and Pete's two daughters um, are now in-house as well as the third generation um, operating the small family-run organization. So lots of history, lots of experience in the travel industry, coupled with uh, Smithsonian's uh, knowledge and background and access is what really kind of sets these programs apart and makes them unique. Here's a brief map of the places where Smithsonian student travel programs go in the summer. Um, so places like 
you know, Alaska, Ecuador, uh, North America, Spain, Portugal, France, Greece and Italy, Australia, Japan, all over the place. And all of these can be found on our website, smithsonianstudenttravel.org. Um, most of our programs range from 14 to 19 days long. We often offer multiple departures of the same program to allow you know, students with busy summer schedules to find something that fits their interests and needs. Uh, all of our programs, aside from Costa Rica, are open to students completing grades eighth through 12th. So it's the grade that you're currently finishing uh, that measures your eligibility. We get a number of you know, students every year from all of those grades, eighth through 12th grade. You know, people often ask what's the median, 15, 16 years old, but uh, our programs are really designed for this eighth through 12th age group. Costa Rica is a little bit different. We have some limitations at one of the research stations that we stay. So students for that program need to be 16 uh, by the summer that they travel. Typical group size, 14, 16, 18 students, somewhere in there with two full-time group leaders. Some of our programs might have 21 or 24 students with three group leaders, but that's the average is kind of 16 to 22 students, two to three weeks long, grades eight through 12 all over the world. So I mentioned briefly Smithsonian student travel leaders. I mentioned before, uh, I'm one of the hiring directors here. I've been working in experiential outdoor education for almost 20 years now. I've been with Putney for over a decade specifically. I started as a program leader. My background is in marine science and conservation. I've led a number of programs uh, over the years to places like Belize and Bali and Australia um, and islands in the Caribbean, Dominica. So that's how I got my start in this uh, industry. And I was a student traveler when I was in high school. I wasn't able to go with uh, Putney or Smithsonian, but I did uh, spend three weeks of my uh, summer between my freshman and sophomore year in England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. And I know firsthand the impact that these trips can have because they happen to me. Um, and part of the reason is the leadership on our program. So here is just a selection of staff um, that lead our trips. They all go through a vetting process. They go through multiple rounds of interviews. They do reference checks, background checks every year. Uh, these are often professionals in the field. The average age of our leaders uh, on these programs is 28, 29 years old. Uh, these are people that know the places where we travel, can add content, have backgrounds in the program themes, speak local languages, and can really serve as cultural liaisons between our students and the places uh, that we visit and the people that we meet. They bring a passion to what we do. They're also really great at focusing on the group dynamic of the program. So we get you know, 16, 18 students from all over the country. Most of them don't know each other ahead of time and our leaders are really gonna be able to facilitate kind of that, that icebreaker, that those team bonding dynamics where students are gonna have opportunities to travel with like-minded peers, make amazing friends, um, you know, share a laugh over a meal, go through those adventures together and create lifelong memories right alongside our leaders. They're with the group 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all the meals, accommodations, they manage the logistics of the program, the health and safety, the group dynamic again, and many times serve as mentors for our students well after the program ends, writing letters of recommendation or just giving input or support through high school and college and things like that. So these are often lifelong um, you know, relationships that our leaders are able to form with these students. Um, you know, Nico there led our New York to Denmark program last year. He's a professional architect. He took time out of his schedule um, in order to join our programs. David Rodriguez Mora, very similar, has a background in, in botany, wildlife conservation, ethnobotany, uh, and was able to join our Costa Rica program last year. Uh, Pat McLaughlin is a PhD from Drexel. He worked on panda, re, panda reintegration. He managed a field station in Equatorial Guinea, just a really amazing uh, field you know, biologist that takes time out of his schedule. Um, because all of these leaders, uh, as well as being professionals in the field, just love working with and mentoring uh, students and forming those relationships and, and helping students see the world through a new lens and a new perspective. So those leaders, again, are with all of our programs through the duration, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And in addition, another thing that sets our programs apart from maybe some other summer opportunities uh, is the addition of Smithsonian student travel experts. Again, these are 
uh, people that will come in to each program uh, for anywhere from four to five days or so uh, and add their expertise as well. These are doctors and PhD and engineers and architects and all of these amazing, amazing qualifications uh, where they're having meals with the students. They'll give a couple of formal talks in the evenings about their work, their research that's relevant to the program. But they're on all of the activities and excursions. They're playing games with the students. They're at nightly meeting. They're having the meals. So there's opportunities for a lot of the informal conversation that happens as well um, with these professionals. And again, it's just kind of this added value and an opportunity for students to meet some really amazing professionals in their field um, you know, on site, not over Zoom, not in a classroom setting, but actually out exploring uh, the places where our uh, groups travel. Gita, for example, um, at the bottom in the middle there, uh, is returning to uh, serve as an expert on our New York to Denmark program this year. She was with us last year, a true highlight of the program in New York City. She's an adjunct professor, professor of architecture and urban design at Columbia. Uh, she got a degree from the School of Planning and Architecture in New Delhi. She has a PhD from the University of Tokyo. Um, she's been a speaker at various women-centric conferences, and she's really able to bring a global perspective to sustainable design and architecture. Uh, she's on the Waterfront Management Advisory Board in New York City. Um, just an incredible asset to walk around and point things out and have meaningful discussions with the students uh, while they're in New York. Um, we can talk about um, who else, any of these other people are just incredible. Francisco uh, is a master's and PhD in medieval Iberian history at the University of UC Berkeley. He's a professor of history in the Department of Humanities in Madrid, and he'll be joining us uh, on our Portugal and Spain program uh, this summer as well through the Iberian Peninsula. All of their bios are up on our website, on the web pages. Go learn more about them. There's a couple of webinars that we did with Gita as well, uh, if you want to look through those. But just an amazing opportunity to connect with um, these professionals in the field. So for now, we're going to go deeper into a couple of programs. We'll start with our Washington, D.C. and Houston Aerospace and the Race to Mars program. Uh, just to give you a better sense of kind of the day-to-day -day of this program, but also the general flow of our trips. We put together uh, a really solid infrastructure for all of our programs. I have a, a slew of colleagues here that are specialists in all of these areas. My colleague Devin is the program coordinator specifically for the Washington DC and Houston program. So she's the one throughout the year making reservations, lining up talks and activities for our students to do along the way. Um, and she's the one too that's gonna be answering your emails and your questions should they arise before you, you know, apply to, to travel with us this summer. So don't hesitate to reach out. Devin's putting together a really incredible uh, program for this summer. Again, it's looking like it'll be you know, 14, 16 students with two leaders. Uh, we'll have Paul Glenshaw, Glenshaw and possibly Naya as well, joining us on the program this summer as the experts. Um, open to eighth through 12th graders, it's really perfect for students who are you know, curious about air, flight, engineering, general exploration, the sciences, STEM, space, you know, SpaceX, Tesla, all of those things. Uh, this is a really great opportunity for students to get their hands on um, you know, these fields and learn a little bit more about this. Now, a student doesn't have to know that they want to be an astronaut or an aerospace engineer even if they have some excitement or curiosity about flight or planes or whatever it is, perfect program uh, for curious students, just kind of checking out what they're, you know, might be interested in. So the program starts in Washington, DC. We arrange flights uh, for most of our international programs. For the domestic programs like this, we just tell families arrive in DC at this airport by this time on this day. The leaders will be there to meet you at baggage claim, collect everybody, and start your trip together. So we spend five days exploring Washington, D.C., and then we head uh, to Shenandoah National Park uh, in the valley outside of the city for two more days, and then we fly down to Houston uh, for four days uh, before flying out. And again, at the end of the program, we'll give you uh, information, book your flight out of the Houston airport after 9 a.m. at the end of the program, 
Our leaders will take all the students there, make sure they make their flights and their connections. Uh, and that's the end of the program as well. So while we're in DC for those five days, again, the students all arrive, we collect students as they're coming in. And once the whole group is formed, we'll head to our accommodations for that afternoon. We stay at a hotel, uh, just an independent hotel that's kind of centrally located in the city. It's not far from the National Mall, uh, which gives us great access to the museum and the Smithsonian itself. Um, students on this program, at least while they're in DC, stay in quads. So we separate uh, by gender identity, four students to a room. The leaders are right there with them as well. And that's our home base for that time that we're in Washington, DC. That afternoon, we'll have an orientation to the program. So we'll sit down as a group, we'll introduce each other, find out why we're all here, what we're excited about, start that team bonding and that group dynamic experience, um, you know, go over rules, expectations for the programs, what the next, you know, 12 days are going to look like, um, and then an opportunity to go out and have our first meal together in DC. I know the groups last year uh, had a plan and a goal of trying a different type of cuisine in DC. The food scene there is pretty good every night. Uh, so I know they, you know, the first night of the program last year, for example, they uh, went to an Ethiopian restaurant just to try an assortment of different things. So Paul Glenshaw, the expert, will also join for part of our time in Washington, D.C. and be with the group on some of these activities. Um, but we'll have opportunities, again, to go to the castle on the National Mall, learn a little bit more about the history of the Smithsonian itself. Right in front or down the road from the castle is the Air and Space Museum, uh, which hopefully we'll get to at least visit a little bit this year. It is undergoing renovation. But we also have opportunities to go to the Udvar Hazi Center, which is known as the nation's hangar, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, last year, students in the groups were able to visit the, Air, uh, the College Park Aviation Museum, as well as the Natural History Museum, um, and bringing in those unexpected connections, like going to the Natural History Museum you might think, what does this have to do with flight, but actually studying how butterflies and birds um, you know, fly through the air is going to really inform how uh, flight and space exploration, you know, for lack of a better term, got its wings. Um, last year uh, and this year, again, presentations uh, from experts that we meet along the way on things like the race between the Wright brothers and Samuel Langley, who at the time was the secretary of the Smithsonian. They were kind of in a race uh, to see who could do the first uh, powered flight. Uh, have opportunities to do things like visit Arlington National Cemetery, visit JFK's tomb, talk a little bit about, you know, the, the first mission uh, to the moon that JFK supported. Uh, so there's some connections there. Um, even opportunities to visit places like the American Art and Portrait Gallery, have expert talks from Paul and other people that we meet along the way. Um, even visiting the National Cathedral where they actually have the stained glass window where uh, there's a moon rock suspended in the middle of it. So connections there as well. Um, meeting with a scientist uh, and looking at the Natural History Museum's meteorite collection. I know last year students were able to hold the four billion year old uh, space rock and really get kind of an in-depth behind the scenes look at uh, the meteorite collection with an expert in the field. So students can really ask questions, learn a lot more. There's a lot to do on these programs. There's a lot to see in DC, but we also save plenty of time for fun on all of our programs. So I mentioned about really solid infrastructure, but we leave some of that time built in for organic activities, for fun activities, and for the students to really say, this is what I'm interested in. Can we try this? Can we go there? and to give our leaders some ownership over making those decisions as well, like visiting the Library of Congress, um, or even going out and doing a private, you know, renting a private karaoke room uh, at night for the students to bond and sing and play games and have fun as well. Uh, I mentioned the Udvar Hazi Center. Um, it's where the SR-71 Blackbird is. There's the Bell X-1, uh, where Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier. The Space Shuttle Discovery is there. Uh, and we even had a talk from a NASA photojournalist about their work and, and research as well. So unlimited uh, things to do in Washington, DC. We're busy, we're exploring, we're out and about. Nothing about these programs is classroom-based, um, real hands-on opportunities for our students. After the time that we're in DC, we load up the vans and we drive out to the Shenandoah Valley. We stop at the uh, Luray Caverns along the way to 
get underground and explore some stalagmites, stalagmites and stalactites. Uh, and then we stay at a place called the Skyland Lodge in Shenandoah National Park. It's a little more disconnected. There's not great Wi-Fi or cell service, which is actually kind of nice to get out into nature and hike around. Um, it's also an opportunity to do a guided astronomy, astronomy talk uh, with someone, uh, an outside person that we bring in to meet the students. It's great star viewing in the Shenandoah Valley, which is part of the reason why we go there to talk about, um, you know, constellations and planets and all that kind of stuff. And then we have a full day working with another uh, outfitter to learn how to build and then actually launch rocket model rockets on the program. So you can see in the bottom right hand side of the corner there, uh, our students building their rockets. We, you know, we put them on the thing, we do the countdown, we get to shoot them up into the sky, hopefully the parachutes deploy and the students actually get to uh, keep them and ship them home. Uh, after they build them as well. So a really cool uh, activity, really relevant, but it gives us an opportunity to get out of DC and explore the camp countryside a little bit as well. And then finally, we drive from Shenandoah back to the airport. We fly down to Houston as a group on a flight that we arrange ahead of time. Uh, families pay for it separate from their tuition, uh, but it's a group flight down to Houston. And then we have three pretty jam-packed days while we're in Houston as well. Um, so we stay at a hotel kind of right near the Johnson Space Center, not far from there. Um, it's also super close to a kind of a, a boardwalk, which is fun for games and food and activities in the evenings. We do a visit to the Lone Star Flight Museum and have opportunities to chat with all of their experts. And then we do two full days at the Johnson Space Center doing mini lessons and what they call the Stars and STEM uh, kind of initiative. So our students get to visit the buoyancy lab. Uh, we visit a space tech lab facility, a spacesuit testing facility, flight simulators. Um, those are, you know, two full days, just meeting with professionals in the field, getting up close to the space center, mission control, ISS, all of that stuff firsthand. And then in the afternoons and evenings, again, time to explore Houston, visit some roller coasters, talk about G-Force, spend time on the boardwalk and continue bonding uh, with your group. And that kind of brings the program to, end, to, the, to an end. We wrap up projects um, you know, along the way. We encourage all of our students to take on independent projects, which I can talk a little bit more uh, towards the end of the presentation. Uh, and then we put our students on, the, on their flights out of Houston back home. So that's a little bit more in depth. Uh, onto the day-to-day -day of that program. A lot of the activities that we do, the people that we meet, um, really active, really fun. Uh, students are gonna learn a ton, but they're doing it in a really experiential, adventurous kind of way uh, and meeting, meeting interesting new people too. So I mentioned Naya and Paul earlier uh, as the experts that will be joining the program. Uh, Paul is a filmmaker and a writer. He produced a documentary for PBS about World War I. Um, he's a contributing author and editor for Air and Space Magazine. He's an expert in the Wright Brothers and pre-World War I aviation. And again, he'll uh, likely be joining us for a few days while we're in Washington, D.C. Uh, and doing all those visits with us. Uh, and then Naya is an aspiring mission specialist. Uh, she was on the Forbes 30 Under 30 in 2021. She's got an aerospace, she's an aerospace engineering PhD student currently. Uh, she has a BS in aerospace engineering and astronautics. She's a NASA Pathways intern. It goes on and on. Uh, we're hoping that she'll be able to join us in Houston for at least a few days um, towards the end of the program as well. So I should mention that for this specific trip, Washington, D.C. and Houston, we did offer two departures. The first departure, unfortunately, is no longer available, but the July 23rd departure uh, is available. We still have space. Um, and we would encourage you to put your applications in soon um, if that's something that you're interested in. And I can talk about that process at the end as well. That's a lot. Uh, that's DC and Houston. There's more on the website. If you have further, more specific questions, again, put them in the chat or give us a call and you can speak with me or Devin, the program coordinator directly, and we're happy to, to talk you through it. Next, we're going to move to Greece and Italy, another really popular program of ours. We're really excited uh, to be offering two departures this summer. Again, we have space available on both, although it's getting a little limited. 
Uh, so if this is the program that you're mostly excited about or interested in, again, I encourage you to get an application in uh, and a deposit down soon to hold that spot. But this program focuses on ancient civilization, history, and myth, as well as all of the adventurous hiking, swimming, snorkeling, stand-up paddle boarding, boat rides, and all of the other uh, kind of fun adventurous stuff as well. So the program for this, we arrange a group flight from New York um, into Greece, into Athens, uh, and at the end from Rome back to New York. That is an addition to the tuition. It's, group flights are not included, but again, we block out seats with an airline. We have a contract with them, and you just tell us, yep, I'm going to fly with the students. We will give you the exact information that you need when you need to be in New York at the beginning, when you can depart at the end. The leaders will meet all of the students in New York and fly with them uh, to start the program. And then one of our leaders will escort the group back to the States as well. We always have an, a leader on those escorted international flights. So we make that pretty easy. If you have questions about doing something different, meeting them in Athens or staying in Italy at the end, we can talk about that. We'd love to be able to accommodate what we can, um, but more than 90% of our students travel on the flights that we've identified with our leaders. So we spend two days in Athens, four days in Crete, a few days in Santorini, and then we head to Naples and Rome for the last eight or so days before flying home. So beginning in Athens, we have opportunities uh, first to settle into our hotel, which actually overlooks the Acropolis. After a long travel day, we tend to uh, spend that first afternoon or evening that we're there, just kind of adjusting to the time, the culture shock, uh, making sure the students are well hydrated and fed, I know last year they went out for uh, an amazing Greek meal the very first night that they were there. Again, doing that orientation with the students, starting to build the group dynamics, setting expectations for the program on that first night, doing individual check-ins with each student so that the leaders get to know them right off the bat um, and start to build that kind of sense of community because you are traveling uh, with peers um, you know, through the next few weeks of the program and just setting up those expectations early are a big part of our uh, trip. Um, from there, opportunities to explore the city streets, archaeological museums, amazing food along the way. Um, we did a guided visit to the Acropolis and the Parthenon, um, also the Agora, and I know last year at least a favorite uh, of the students was trying as much uh, kind of gelato and ice cream as they could along the way uh, and doing taste tests too. Um, so that's a quick two days in Athens to start the program. And from there, we hop on a ferry actually um, from Athens to Crete, which is the largest island in Greece. It's the birthplace of the Minoan civilization. Um, and while we're in Crete, we have opportunities to hike Mount Ida, which is the highest peak on the island, uh, rent paddle boards or go swimming along the coast, rocky coastline, um, explore artisan markets, sample plenty of cheese and seafood. Um, the groups uh, have an opportunity to visit Psycho Cave, which is Zeus' mythological birthplace. Uh, and again, kind of check out those rocky shorelines and the beautiful Mediterranean Sea. So a really solid mix of seeing the sites, um, being out with guides and experts, but also having opportunities to bond with your friends, be adventurous, try new things, um, have fun, swim, paddleboard, all of those kind of activities. From Crete, we actually travel to the island of Santorini, um, and it's specifically the, uh, one of the iconic villages along the coast where you see these uh, beautiful whitewashed buildings with the blue domes, so picturesque and pretty iconic. Um, we'll spend pen plenty of time uh, kind of exploring those um, that region as well. Visit the archaeological site of Akrotiri. Um, the groups last year, and I believe this year, the plan is to do a sunset cruise around the island as well with dinner, just to give a different perspective of the island uh, and some of its hidden gems as well. Um, you know, work with local artisans. We did, we'll do a pottery class with like a local artisan where students will actually get to shape uh, their own bowl. So it's all hands-on experiential. It's not just lectures and museums, it's getting out there, meeting people, trying new things and actually immersing yourself in the culture and having that interaction and that cultural exchange as well. Oftentimes our leaders will say, 
listen, for the next hour, you have groups of three or four. Your scavenger hunt is to go find X, Y, Z in the market, have at least two conversations with uh, local proprietors along the way and bring the food back. We'll go have a picnic and we'll talk about what you learned and who you met. So getting our students to engage with locals along the way, encouraging them to be travelers and not tourists. This is not just an on the bus, off the bus, check the bucket list kind of item. It's super immersive and experiential. The students are gonna learn a ton along the way uh, while they're doing it. So from Santorini, we actually hop on a plane and we head towards Naples and then Rome uh, for the end of the program. So opportunities, there's a place uh, called Christmas Alley, uh, which is where artisans for centuries have been carving super intricate uh, nativity dioramas, uh, which is really unique and interesting. So you have opportunities to meet with those artisans, um, visit Pompeii, learn about the history of the eruption and those cities uh, kind of being rejuvenated after being buried from ash. Um, plenty of time to stroll cobblestone streets, meet archaeologists. Um, and then the experts come in uh, for this part of the program as well and have an opportunity to talk about the forum and the Colosseum and learn about Roman mosaics. And our students will actually have opportunities to create their own mosaics um, as well on the program. Uh, you know, go to outdoor concerts, stroll through the markets, uh, practice a crash course Italian language while ordering, uh, you know, meals at the local restaurant. So really amazing. Again, that's kind of a quick overview. We stay in small, locally run hostels and hotels along the way, not really name brand places, but places where we can interact with the proprietors. For the most part, it's our groups that just take over these places and two, three, four share rooms uh, that are centrally located. Uh, and just, you know, perfect for our groups and an opportunity to, again, kind of have that cross-cultural exchange on our programs. So I mentioned the experts here. Ashley and Chris will be joining uh, two different departures of the program. Uh, Ashley is an art histori historian. She specializes in late medieval and Renaissance art, specifically in Italy. She's an associate professor of art and history. Uh, at Berea College, where she's taught a variety of courses on European art uh, from the ancient world through the 19th century. Uh, she has a master's and a PhD in art history, uh, and a Fulbright uh, allowed her to live in Italy while doing her doctoral research on churches, archives, and museums. Uh, so just an, another amazing opportunity for our students to learn from some of the best, um, you know, in the places where this is happening. Chris is a professor. Uh, spent her entire career creating, leading, and teaching academic programs, specifically in Italy and Greece. She's a classical archaeologist specializing in Roman art, uh, and she's taught university students in Rome for the last 20 years. She's a curatorial uh, capacity in the departments of art at the Smart Museum at the University of Chicago and the RISD Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. She's also worked at the Vatican Museums. Um, so again, like I could go on and on about the amazing people that come in, in addition to the leaders uh, that students have access to. So that was uh, a little more in depth into the day to day of the Italy and Greece program as well. Now a little bit of an overview. Thank you all for still sticking sticking here with us. Uh, we'll kind of wrap things up in the next few slides and then have some time for a Q and A. Um, so the Smithsonian experience. I've talked a lot about on the programs, how this all kind of comes into play, but innovative programming uh, is at the top of the list. These programs are innovational, um, ed innovative, I should say, educational and fun. This is the summer, it's not school. Students are gonna learn a ton, um, but it's meant to be done in a really adventurous, outside the classroom uh, with like-minded peers kind of way. So these are unique experiences. Uh, with just amazing local contacts and experts. They're designed to be educational, um, but they're also fun and exciting. Opportunities to explore some of the world's most stunning landscapes, uh, ruins, and vibrant cities through the Smithsonian lens. So from hiking through cloud forest in Costa Rica to kayaking, kayaking or stand-up paddleboarding in Greece, or even snorkeling with rays and turtles in Belize, you know, there's really no shortage of adventure and excitement on any of these trips. 
So the gender and cultural interaction, you're going to learn a lot about different cultures and ways of life. Um, it's not all just lectures and visiting museums and archaeological sites, uh, but really immersing yourself from, from minute one in local culture. Uh, students are trying new foods. They're learning traditional dances. They're interacting with local artisans. They're participating in hands-on artisanal experiences, like making mosaics or learning how to weave um, you know, traditional baskets or uh, you know, doing pottery or any of those other things, learning to make cheese or chocolate. It's all hands-on or pasta, especially in Italy. Um, and it's a catalyst for cross-cultural exchange. Our groups do not exist within a bubble that just moved from place to place. We are integrated into the places that we travel and Putney has 70 years of doing that uh, in the places that we go. So really amazing opportunities there. Experiential, uh, hands-on, learning by doing. And the group dynamic is really a chance to connect with other like-minded teens from all over the country uh, who share similar passions and interests in adventure and exploration. I think it takes a certain type of student that wants to spend part of their summer on a program like this alongside new friends, trying new things, getting out of their comfort zone. Um, most of our students travel solo without knowing anybody ahead of time which really allows for that group or, or dynamic to come together organically. Um, and like I said before, whether it's like sharing a laugh over dinner or bonding with your uh, peers during you know, a thrilling adventure, our students are really creating memories and friendships that can really last a lifetime. Uh, I talked about my experience in high school and that's why I'm here and I believe in, in our mission so deeply because it it had a profound effect on, on my life at 15 or 16 years old. And that's what we want to offer to these students, an opportunity to get out of this comfort zone, to try new things, gain new perspectives, become better world citizens and have those kind of lifelong um, transformations as well. And fun is, is at the root of it all. Um, it's all a good time. So these programs are a perfect blend, really, of education, adventure, and fun. It's a great way uh, for teens these, this age to see the world separate from their parents, but in a really structured environment with, with their peers and leaders and guides. I'm seeing some questions rolling in. Keep them coming. Thanks for that. And one other kind of piece of, of the puzzle that's really unique to Smithsonian programs is the Learning Lab. This is an online digital resource that's proprietary to, to the Smithsonian. They're basically digital digitizing all of their artifacts, their archives, millions and millions and millions of pieces of art and music and history and writing and photos and all different kinds of things. And that framework is what the students have an opportunity to use throughout the course of the program. So I mentioned independent projects and we encourage every student to take on something that piques their interest, whether it's about the food or the people or the art or the waste or the sustainability or whatever it is. Um, our students have the learning lab at their fingertips tips as a way to do research, to learn more about the place, learn more about the archives. Uh, and then we have our students create their own little learning lab. Um, by the end of the program, they can upload their own photos, their own drawings, their own interviews and videos with people uh, to kind of create a curated thing about in 2023, this was my experience in Italy. Uh, here it is, and next year the students on the program can look back and see, oh, this is what this place was like this, last year, this is who we met, this is my experience this year, and it's a way, again, to gain knowledge um, and increase it year over year for our students and the resources of the Smithsonian's incredible tool to have at our fingertips this summer. So just a few last things here, a little additional information. Health and safety obviously is number one priority for us. Our leaders are all first aid CPR certified, but we also know where all the best doctors and hospitals are, pharmacies and the places that we visit. That comes with Putney's 70 years of experience. Um, so we're not gonna put students into harm's way. Our leaders are there to help mitigate that risk. If something were to come up, we are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all summer long. Myself and my colleagues are sitting here in our offices answering the phones. If the leader needs to get in touch with us, if you need to get in touch with us, the phone lines are always open. Again, 24 hours a day, it rings right by our bedside. Um, so two-way communication on the programs. 
We encourage our students not to use their cell phones as much as possible during the trip. Sure, they can check in with home uh, when it's appropriate, but we really want our students to be able to focus on the group and the experience and really be in the moment and not worried about what's going on back home. So all of our programs keep a blog throughout the summer that families can follow, get updates. It's often written by students or photos posted by students of the experience. That's a great way to stay in touch as well. Um, and we do have an application process for these programs. So again, it's a pretty self-selecting group, but the application process involves two teacher references and an applicant statement. That teacher references, once you hold your space in the program with a $700 deposit, you give us the email addresses of two teachers. We send them a digital form. They fill it out online. It comes right back to us. It's pretty quick and easy. And then we also provide a, a writing section for students to write just a paragraph or two about why they're excited and interested about this particular program. We just wanna make sure the students are coming for the right reasons. They're excited to be on the trip. Um, you know, it's not like getting into college. It's not a college essay. We're not turning a ton of students away, but we just wanna know it's a right fit for the summer and that the student's excited to be in a small group of like-minded peers uh, away from their family uh, and to spend on a, on a trip like this. So if you have any other questions about the application process, give us a call or you can visit the website, click apply now, it'll walk you through everything. Um, at this time of year, we do take a $700 deposit to hold your space in the program. That then gives you access to the teacher references and the applicant statement. Once we receive those back, we make a formal decision of acceptance. And once you're accepted into the program, we provide you with access to what we call a digital locker, which is where we're going to provide you a detailed packing list, reading and media recommendations, if, in case you're interested in watching you know, some movies or reading some articles before you travel that are relevant. Uh, all the flight information, FAQs specific to the destination, itineraries more detailed about the destination, who your leaders are, all of that kind of stuff is in that digital resource. Um, and that's how you would pay your final balance of the tuition as well. So here's a quick breakdown of many of the programs. Like I said, some of the dates of these programs are no longer available. Um, things are filling up. So we do encourage families, especially this time of year, uh, to get applications in soon in order to get into your first choice program. Uh, if the first choice program is no longer available, we encourage you to choose a second choice as well. Um, and we can talk about that. Just give us a call uh, at your convenience. We can answer any questions about any of these trips. DC, Houston, Italy and Greece, we went super in depth through today, but anything else you see here, Portugal, Spain, you know, Iceland, New York, Denmark, Costa Rica, really great options. Um, and the format of those programs is gonna follow very similarly to what we went through today. Types of places that we stay, group size, a mix of, um, you know, structure and activities and meetings, but also room for organic experiences and growth. and you know, we really encourage our students to be active participants in these programs, bring their own kind of thoughts, ideas, wishes, what they want to get out of it as well. And our leaders are there to help facilitate all of that for them. And with that, I am happy to take any live questions. If anyone has any questions, please drop them into the chat. And I think my colleague, there she is, Rebecca. Hi. Um, Hi there. Hi. Um, yeah, we have a couple questions and then please drop more in there. Um, we have time for a couple more. Uh, to start us off, uh, Mike, could you speak a little more about what the educational components of these trips um, that set it apart from other kind of tours? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, we don't like to use the word tour around here. We like uh, traveler and program and trip. The educational component is experiential. It's not classroom-based learning. Um, so between our leaders that are going to have backgrounds in the content or themes or knowledge of the local culture and the experts that join, uh, like I talked about Paul and Naya for DC and Houston, those are Smithsonian experts. So that's those are three or four resources right there that while you're walking through the Coliseum, you know, they're going to be able to say, oh, and by the way, here's, you know, some information or knowledge while you're out. You're not sitting in a classroom getting a lecture. And then also along the way, all of these organic meetings that we set up 
um, as well. So like when we're in Houston at the Johnson Space Center, we're meeting with astronauts and engineers and professionals in the field. That's in addition to the expert and the leaders that are with the group. So it's really organic. Students have tons of time to ask questions, pique their curiosity. There's no test, there's no grades, it's not school. You're gonna learn a ton, but you're gonna have a lot of fun while you do it. Um, so hopefully that kind of answers that question. Yeah, and I think uh, we focus a lot on integrating into the culture and not being travelers and that makes a huge difference. Yeah, um, like, sorry, one example last year, like on the Italy and Greece program, the students were on, I think it was Santorini, um, and they, you know, there's a lot of very touristed beaches there, right? But our students took it upon themselves to do research on maybe some more hidden out of the way, off the beaten path kind of things that tourists don't usually make the effort to get to or try. And our students found a spot and brought it to the leaders and said, can we check out this place? And the leaders made it happen. And they ended up being the only people on this huge stretch of Sandy Beach on the Mediterranean, because we went that extra mile to find the local spots. And I think with, between Smithsonian's experts and Putney's years of history running programs all over the world, um, we know where those spots are and how to get off the beaten path um, and not just do, uh, you know, the check the box things, but really go in depth into the places that we visit. I can take this next one. It's a question about travel day and connecting travel. Um, and can students, uh, are they escorted to their connecting flights or can they wait on their own? That depends largely on the age of your student. Students that are 15 or older, we make sure that their bags are checked, they're in the right terminal, they're through security, that they understand where their flight is departing from, that the flight is there. Um, so there's a little bit of guidance um, and they can always reach us if they get into trouble, but they do go to their gate and wait on their own. And then students that are uh, 14 or younger, um, if you are not traveling with them to meet and depart the group, then there's an unaccompanied minor piece imposed by the airline and we will work through that with you. And we also, um, I don't think you mentioned this, have local airport representatives that we hire on the ground as well. So the international flights are always escorted by one of the program leaders, but then um, for departure and return days domestically, we use primarily New York, Miami, and LA as our hubs, depending on what direction in the world that you're going. And we hire local representatives to be at the airport on those travel days, just to help make sure everyone is getting where they need to be. And since they're local, they don't need to also get on a flight with students back home. And so mm -hmm. they can stay at the airport until we make sure that everyone is in and also make sure that um, everyone makes their connections out at the end. Yep. Uh, does anyone else have any questions they are wanting to ask now? No? A little bit quiet, but we're available pretty much all the time, not 24-7 yet until our first program goes out, but um, definitely 9 to 5 Monday through Friday to answer anything that you may want to chat about. Yep, you can visit the website to learn more about programs and experts and other webinars. Give that number a call, 866-870-2350. We're here nine to five. We're based in Vermont, so East Coast time. Info at smithsonianstudenttravel.org uh, for general questions, or again, give us a call. You can talk to me, you can talk to Devin or any of our program directors uh, yeah. with any further questions. All right. Great. Thank you all for spending uh, a little bit of your afternoon with us. We look forward to hearing from you soon and hopefully, hopefully having you travel with us.